Hey guys, it's Michael. And Carter. This is the third episode of Hammer Circuit. Today, we're going to be talking about how can Eastern philosophy impact our Western thought. All right, let's just go ahead and dive right into it. So we're going to start with the Eastern philosophy part and uh, firstly, pessimism. Right, so pessimism. So um, this is mainly characterized by how most Eastern philosophies explain things as they are. This is this can be seen in Buddhism with the Four Noble Truths, Taoism, and Confucianism. Could you explain Taoism and Confucianism for us, Carter? Sure. So, uh, in a nutshell, a Taoism, it was invented by a man named Lao Tzu, and he wrote a book called The Tao Te Ching. And Tao and Taoism literally just means the way, and it's the go with the flow mentality. They don't believe in dwelling on the past or the future. And as far as the past goes, they don't believe in they don't believe in connecting any emotional and having any strings connected to any emotions of the past of successes or failures. So like a emotional detachment, so to speak. Yeah, and the reason why behind that, um, it obviously makes sense with failures. You don't want to feel bad about something that you've already passed, but successes, like why wouldn't you want to feel accomplished why wouldn't you want to feel good about something that happened in the past well it's simply because that is the past like why are you boasting why are you drowning your ego in you know like why are you basing your ego in um what's the word past events in past why are you trying to boost your ego in such a pretentious manner about something that's already passed They believe in living in the here and now Mm -hmm. and the idea behind being proud and what you can do in the moment to be the best you possibly can be. And then as far as Confucianism goes, uh, Confucianism in the sense of uh, how things are, Confucius, he was around in a time when China was breaking apart into states. Not literally, but he saw society deteriorating in many ways. So it's a bit different from Buddhism and Taoism in that sense, and the fact that he saw humans simply as deplorable. So he created a very strict social and family structure of how to prevent all of that. And this was the result of um, the, the Chinese, the China, the society of China at the time, because, you know, as you said previously, it was breaking apart. Um, something interesting I heard that you were saying was about Taoism, about how um, kind of cutting off those strings. That's similar to Buddhism. They also have a sort of uh, emotional detachment, but it but they also argue to have a balance in things. You know, um, tend to society to a certain degree, but also tend to oneself spiritually. So that's pessimism in Eastern philosophy. Uh, the The second point we would like to discuss is um, Eastern philosophy, uh, some of them have uh, structured approaches. Right, and we're just going to start off the structured approach part with the concept behind chakras. Now, chakras in the Eastern sense, it's not located in China or as in like it doesn't originate from China. It originates from India and a... Um, more of a Hindu, it, it originates from the Hindu approach to breaking down the concepts behind energy. The idea is that there's seven major chakras, and each of the chakras are like a swirling pool of energy within you, and they're all connected together like a creek. And in order to unlock all of your chakras or to purify them, you have to unclog all of the blockage in the creek that is your energy. And it's similar in this to sense uh, to Taoism because they compare your energy to a river. They compare consciousness to a river. But it's a bit different in this sense that Taoism allows for a lot more freedom. It doesn't give any structured sense. And it's different from Confucianism uh, because it doesn't give... Confucianism gives a very structured approach for how things are. But chakras, it's structured but not... It doesn't tell you what to do in every single second, but it gives you a relative it gives you a relative breakdown of how to achieve the spiritual enlightenment. Now, would you like to discuss the eightfold path with Buddhism? Yeah, um it also comes to show that a lot of uh, eastern philosophies um they're very lenient in some of their teachings. 
So in um, unlike the chakras, which is a very linear approach, you start from the base and you un unclog right. and start slowly moving up. Uh, Buddhism has the Noble Eightfold Path, and these and they characterize it as not really step by step directions. Uh, the symbol for this is like an eight spoked wheel, and the um, the eight steps are right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Um, and like they don't mean right as in like it's the right way to do things and there's a wrong way. But it's more in the sense, and that's how it's viewed normally through um, Western thought. But um, they mean like they mean right as in like the correct way or the proper way. I mean they're very similar, but they don't mean like there's a wrong way of doing things and there's a right way. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of what word did you say? Uh, like leniency or what? Uh, freedom. Yeah, there's a lot of freedom in the description of the eightfold path. Um, right, which is the concept behind a dara. Right. Uh, everybody, which is their way. Michael will do a better job of explaining that. Uh, Dara, yes. Um, every person in the every or every human has their own like spiritual way or spiritual path in a sense. So, um, and the, that's the concept behind Adara. Right. So unlike uh, Taoism and Taoism, which is like there is like a singular path and stuff. Um, it's uh, Buddhism is viewed more as like a wheel. Eight spoke to wheel. That's the main symbol. So, so that's the structured approach stuff. Right now, the next point we would like to make is that these, like these things it, that define Eastern philosophy, they don't, they aren't tied to a deity necessarily or a god. So it doesn't attribute salvation or um, in in Buddhism. I know they have nirvana. It doesn't attribute that to a god. Could you explain or elaborate on that point a little bit? Right. So in Buddhism, uh, they believe that uh, every human is born into the world with suffering. And the only way to achieve uh, nirvana or to be liberated from suffering is from within. So um, in, specifically in Buddhism, it's uh, the practice of mindfulness through meditation where you slowly you observe the things that cause you suffering and you can slowly uh, mindfully um, detach yourself and liberate yourself from these uh, causes of suffering and eventually reach nirvana right and that goes into the part of um, it, it's reliant on yourself rather than the deity because you mentioned with the meditation it's up to you you are the one that has to meditate when you look at more monotheistic religions, it, or even with Hinduism a bit more, it's attributed to more gods. Um, this is completely reliant on you. It gives you a sense of salvation, but it doesn't rely on a god to achieve the salvation. Right. It is, it is salvation through your own effort and, your, and through your own discovery. Right, which I really enjoy the concept of. So the next point we like to go to is the different ways of thinking and we're just going to do a bit more of a thorough breakdown of the different eastern philosophies would you like to start michael yeah so buddhism yeah um i did a lot of research on it so that's why i'm explaining. buddhism 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 we just love buddhism here i mean i just love or it. michael i love buddhism. it so much all right so the main key things or thought patterns about buddhism is that transcendence from suffering uh through enlightenment uh, life is filled with suffering. This is um, this is seen through the Four Noble uh, Truths. Um, another key part of um, Buz Buddhism thinking is the three um, the three crowns pearls pearls. Uh, sorry, Michael. Uh, I thought you were the expert on Buddhism. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, Carter, why not you? Why not uh, continue with Taoism? Taoism, okay. So like I mentioned before, it was invented by Lao Tzu. And unlike Confucius, who viewed humans as a deplorable, as like a, a basket of deplorables in a sense, he viewed humans and life as something sweet. Like something that, you know, you, you are what you make of life. Like your life is what you make of it. That's the concept that he tried to push. And... Um, he really advocated for living in the moment 
which was discussed earlier, be proud of who yourself of who you are in the moment rather than being focused on what you're going to be into in the future or what you were in the past. And the last thing, which is a big key point in Taoism or Taoism, um, both mean the same thing, Tao and Tao, right? It's just that for some reason in America, we like Taoism more than Taoism. I don't know I what's think up with that. I think it's because it starts with D and it kind of reminds us t- of the word duality, you know. Two. Right, which is the yin and the yang. That, right. By the way, if you didn't know, Taoism or Taoism is the yin and the yang symbol, the yin yang. Right. And that represents the balance of creation and destruction, which is a, a big thing. It's the concept of balance in Taoism. So would you like to get back to Buddhism? You yeah, were mentioning so the three... I, I, I actually found it. So the, um, the three things are the three jewels of Buddhism. And this is Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Sangha is community. Dharma is pa- is um, your way of path or your your the, your way. Right, like the in, spiritual path we mentioned earlier. Like in Taoism. And then Buddha is like spreading the wisdom and having a teacher to help um, hasten the development of uh, enlightenment. So that's uh, that's uh, that's the way of thinking for Buddhism. I actually got that done. Uh, so, uh, Carter, could you explain uh, Confucianism now? Right. Like I explained it a little bit earlier, but in a nutshell, just to break it down, like I said earlier, uh, Lao he looked at, with Taoism. He looked at life in a very sweet manner. Confucius saw humans as kind of something that was deplorable I've, I've mentioned this multiple times previously but i just want to reiterate or illiterate literate reiterate reiterate thank yeah. you michael thanks i just wanted to point out because that's the big thing that he saw in humans he saw that humans were deplorable and he saw that we needed to be improved and the way that he decided to convince humans to improve was to create a very strict social and family system that people had to follow. And he attributed um, following his system to gods. And the concept behind if you follow his system, you will eventually achieve heaven or, you know, the, the support. The afterlife. Or, or the afterlife, exactly. And this is, this is a lot different than Buddhism or Taoism, where a Buddhism sees that everybody's born into the world suffering, but they can, every, even within a single human lifetime, can uh, reach enlightenment. While Taoism, su- stuff like family and the, thing, the rules that Confucianism puts forth can actually be seen as possibly pebbles in the river. Am I mm-hmm. right about the Taoism way? Yeah. Right. So that's how Confucianism is a lot different than the other two that we previously mentioned. And we, we can go a little bit more into depth about it. Well, we explained the Confucianist part. So, but viewpoint wise is Confucian. So like humans are seen deplorable within commu- Confucianism. So why not explain uh, the viewpoint in Taoism? So they see consciousness and humans to be a river. That's how it's really described. As in, we are all connected. And Lao really likes to do this. He really likes to compare things in life to nature. Because the story behind him was he moved to Western China, where he wrote down a lot of his ideals, or ideas, and then he left China completely and basically just became a hermit, where he enjoyed the rest of his life oh, out wow. in nature. So he saw that we are all connected in a way. He saw that we are all one rather than us being separate. We are individuals in the sense that we can enact, we can act, uh, execute our consciousness in certain ways, mm-hmm. but the sense that we are all connected and we're all flowing down a very similar path. And he also pointed out how you don't necessarily want to change the river, you seek to understand it. Now, that sounds really hippie, right? That sounds like really kind of weird like aren't we hippies at this point you know in a sense yes since we are talking about eastern philosophies in in such depth but it really makes sense the way that he describes it Mm -hmm. because what he states is the idea is uh we all know people that act that act out improperly i guess you could say they don't have respect for themselves or others right? right so he said, we don't need to 
We don't need to change those people necessarily. That's not what we're going to strive for. For uh, We need to accept the fact that they are a part of the river. They are one with us. Their actions are a part of humans and how humans act, right? So instead, you need to... There's oil in the river, right? There's mm -hmm. pollution in the river. So instead, what you need to do is you need to look at them and use them as an example of what to of how you can improve yourself so you let go and um it also accepts change and it's the idea of let go of who you are to discover what you will become it's the idea of if you want to know what you are going to become sometimes you have to let go of who you are right now and just go with the flow which is the concept of the river and you need to learn from others around you at the same time. Yeah, and that's very similar to Buddhism. Buddhism places an emphasis on um, spreading joy, compassion, being kind. One quote I've found is that it says that thousands of candles can be lighted from a single candle, which is similar to the river aspect in which we're, we're all connected in some way, you know, cause and effect, helping others, um, spreading the wisdom and joy and compassion. Uh, this is very this is a uh, defined or one of the uh, concepts of this is called bohichita i'm not sure if i said it correctly but um it focuses on living in a balanced way um a deep wish to ho hope or help others um achieve enlightenment compassion and then the six perfections of generosity which would include ethics patience effort concentration and wisdom uh, interesting quote about wisdom it says is that wisdom transcends the mind and is the result of direct comprehension of the truth which is really interesting it talks about how understanding is just like a key part of having the wisdom you know go beyond the mind right which makes sense that's that's what a lot of eastern philosophy strives for the the toning and enhancement of the consciousness through wisdom through accumulating knowledge Right. throughout your life and wisdom is seems to be placed with higher value than the um than just events that occur in life so we've covered um quite a bit about eastern philosophy right now How about and we, we were we were just like going down a list at that point of things that we found important right now we're going to segment into how westerners think because remember this whole right. um what we're talking about is how can eastern philosophy impact our western thought so we were just going going down the list of what eastern philosophy is just so you guys can understand and now we're going to we're going to talk about what we see in our day-to-day -day lives yeah. of how westerners could possibly learn a few lessons from eastern philosophy would you like to start michael yeah so uh let's see how this turns out okay so one thing that we found um westerns uh we're westerns ourselves i guess is that uh they tend to look for simple solutions. This is very, very evident in America. For example, there's a 400% rise in antidepressant prescriptions since 1988, according to the Center for Disease Control, or the CDC. On contrary, Carter discovered that there was a monk that did what exactly? So, I might pronounce his name incorrectly. It's Yonge uh, Minyar Rinpoche, and he was suffering from panic attacks. And he used meditation to overcome his panic attacks. He doesn't have them anymore. And he described his panic attacks as a monkey in his head that just wanted too many bananas. Which is an interesting way to think about it. And we aren't necessarily stating that antidepressants are just... It's not a black and white issue. It's a very gray area. It, yeah. But it might open up um, a little bit of thought into maybe not everything has to be solved with um, mind-altering uh, synthetic substances like uh, antidepressants. I agree so. with that. Um, it's A lot of the times I see there's people that don't want to ever work for something. They never, like for instance, you ever see those bizarre ads where it's like, you can get a six pack in one week if you take this medicine. Right, this like the m metabolism pills yeah, that you just can burn these... all the fat away mm -hmm. somehow. And it shows people don't have the mindset of they don't understand the idea that 
if you want to accomplish things, it's not going to come to you right off the bat. You actually have to work for a lot of these things. This is also evident uh, in um, Buddhism, where one of the um, parts of the Eightfold Path is a um, right livelihood or like right mm-hmm. effort to a degree. You need you have to apply effort to um, to achieve things and to transcend upon uh, or above uh, suffering. Uh, another thing is that in regards to like the philosophy and religion is that uh, in Western thought there is um, there is very specific mantras that are being subscribed to. Uh, Carter, would you like to elaborate on this? Right. So there's a lot of people that find themselves troubled in life and they feel like there is one specific doctrine or way that they need to follow to solve their issues. And before, like we said, with people looking for simple solutions, people will just, they don't want to put in work to things to, to solve their issues. A lot of the times they're just looking for a pill. Same thing, but for philosophy or for religions. People search for a lot of uh, monotheistic religions that have a savior figure in it. Like, this isn't to bash any specific religious group, but you see people saying, Jesus saved me, Muhammad saved me, etc., etc. People will go down the line of all the monotheistic religions and will claim that they saved them when that's not what eastern philosophy advocates for the the issue is and then again i am not trying to bash on any monotheistic religions is that monotheistic religions are very rigid and you can turn to them multiple times but it's very rarely that they're going to be able to solve all your problems rather while eastern philosophy um advocates for a more fluid discover your own approach solve the issues from within right and it can be rigid like we mentioned with the chakras it's a bit more rigid right there but unlike um and this isn't to say that these monotheistic religions aren't offering time for people to reflect or do something similar to meditation but it's requiring you to subscribe or accept that there is a deity that you need in order for you to figure out answers to your problems when it comes to Buddhism or Taoism. Uh, It's the idea that the way that you reach salvation is through you doing it, which even ties back into point number one, which is the idea that people are looking for simple solutions. People don't want to have to work necessarily to reach these, to find their solutions. They just want something quick, simple, a single figure, a single God, or a single way that can just give them all the answers, and then they're done. And, you know, it's very hard to find anything like that unless it comes from within that could solve all those issues just magically or something. And that gives into um, possibly the next uh, point is that um, giving, giving into desire which is, you know, using the pill, turning turning to, looking for the fastest approach. Right. It's the idea that we deserve immediate pleasure without sacrifice. We talk about work a lot, how it's needed. Michael mentioned with Buddhism, how it requires work. Can you just break down some of the work that goes into the meditation? I get meditation is meant to remove you from suffering but the act in and of itself with meditation does require work effort and time it requires waking up you know possibly early in the morning put aside putting aside time within the morning and the afternoon to sit down finding a quiet place and slowly um slowly drift into a state of um without fear of the future or the past, without dwelling on the past or future, and just having a single pointed concentration on a specific goal or thought or specific concept, like one of the um, parts of the Eightfold Path. So it requires a lot of concentration and, and it and it takes sometimes it takes a lot of time for beginners and a little bit less time for um, uh, more, uh, pe- more experienced users. Another, right. another thing which is the giving into desires is that uh, America purchases about nearly 100% of the hydrocodon and the 80% of oxycodon according to Nash- National Institute on Drug Abuse. 
Now, I don't exactly know what those two drugs are, so could you explain them in a little bit more detail? They're opioids. Okay. That, that's really what they are. And it's incredible to think that out of the entire world, we purchased nearly 100% of the hydrocodone and 81% of the oxocodone. And it gives you, it really breaks down the idea that we think that we deserve just, we deserve pleasure right away. And I'm not saying that a lot of the drugs being prescribed and a lot of the drug use isn't righteous, but let's face it, we aren't in any more or less pain than Europeans. That's not, that's just the simple truth about America. So, And then you look at areas like Africa or the Middle East and you know, that seems to put certain things in perspective. Right. Perhaps. It's if only twenty percent of the world is using oxycodone, roughly twenty percent of the rest of the world is using oxycodone, and we're using the rest of it, the the other eighty percent, it gives you an idea of how much pain medication we're using. We are using way too much of it to try to get immediate re- results to our pain. When if you look at Eastern philosophy. It requires work, what Michael was describing, possibly waking up early in the morning to meditate. And we get the physical pain and the mental pain don't exactly go hand in hand always. But what we will find is, is that, uh, what we will find is, with the monks, like the monk mentioned early, uh, earlier, Yangri, he conquered his panic attacks with meditation. So there is actual things that people can do to try to tame down or fix their actual issues without immediately going to pills or medications to solve their right. problems. And I think an, another thing is that there's a, there's a lack of appreciation in some aspects of a Western thought. Absolutely. Like, you know, anecdotal experiences, as in, like, they're, you know, always paying attention to what happened to you and never actually possibly listening to the stories of others. You know, not not really accepting that we're all kind of connected in a way as seen in Taoism and we all kind of go through the same pains, you know. I think that we shouldn't really get stuck in the mindset that we have our problems and they're very unique. I mean, humans, to a certain degree, we all experience very similar problems to well, varying we degrees. Su- we have the same, we suffer some of the same uh, pains, we humans, and... We can speak for ourselves, and I'm pretty sure a lot of other people can speak. We'll find people that are just venters. They'll just go on and on, and they mm-hmm. never look for solutions when they're complaining about something. They just complain because they want to complain. All right. And as a result of, you know, possibly a lack of meaning for some things and, like, you know, having to somehow cope with it, there is this... Um, perfectionist attitude in certain aspects you know there are people who are constantly and we're, they're just constantly trying to find ways to achieve more and stuff and like sometimes they have an end goal in mind but others just kind of do it do it just to, to maybe put up a facade or something and i mean that's not the best example but the, i think an issue in western thought is that is that um you have to do as much as possible and that uh that can be seen in the beauty standards, uh, high anxiety levels. Right. Can I just like mention a study yeah. about the anxiety levels? Now, this is a meta-analysis study that was put out by several uh, research journals. I believe – I'm trying to remember where exactly it was from. I can't quite remember right now. But the studies concluded that – and I first was alerted by this by a meme. I thought it was just a meme at first, right. but then I did research behind it. And it turns out it was true. Oh, and wow. the statistic was that the average high school student suffers the same amount of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the fifties. And you would have to wonder, like, what's causing this increased amount of anxiety? We're fifty years. It's like, you know, what what happened? From it. 50, like 60 years ago, roughly. What happened within a 60-year period to cause so much anxiety within our population? Like, the, I guess you what, you could, what you deem as the youth, you know? What happened within that time period? 
So that's something that we might um, discuss in our next podcast about how there's been rising levels of anxiety due to possibly new innovations and then just new trends and social standards. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys liked uh, our um, podcast on how Eastern philosophy affects Western thought. Carter, the wonderful singing bell. And so this has been Hammer Circuit. I'm Michael. I'm Carter. See you next time.